read her columns so often. I feel I know Margaret Wente, Peggy Wente, reasonably well. She pulls no punches. And because her turf is especially oriented to uh, health care, to education, and to social issues, I'm dying to hear what she thinks about all of this. I think uh, I don't feel old enough. And when I see a presentation like that, I think, where are the grown-ups? <laughs> where are the grown-ups are gonna sort these things out? And then I look around and I realize we're it. I don't feel up to it. Um, I have the great privilege at the paper of choosing my own assignments. And I guess that lets me choose what interests me. And Many of the things that interest me deal with some of the same subjects that Pico Iyer was talking about yesterday. By the way, I'm so glad he was here because I've had a crush on him for 10 years. <laughs> and he deals with cultural clashes and the meeting of different cultural tectonic plates on a global scale. And I like to probe some of those issues here in Canada because um, we think of ourselves, we like to think of ourselves as a pleasant, diverse, tolerant, inclusive, multicultural kind of nation. But we have our culture clashes too, and our values clashes, and those are the really interesting, that's the really interesting stuff. So I write a lot about that. And the questions I keep asking myself, I guess, are questions like these. Are we really as tolerant as we say we are? Are we sometimes too tolerant? In the name of human rights, do we sometimes commit human rights abuses? And when is it right for us to impose our values on them. This is tricky stuff. And it makes up a lot of the stuff of what's before the courts and what's in the papers all the time. Um, it's important, too, for us to try to get a handle because we delegate a lot of these judgments to the state and to agents of the state who have enormous power over people's lives and we ask them to make these judgments for us, for better or for worse. And sometimes the outcomes puzzle me or disturb me or bother me. So I'm going to talk about three stories that I've written about recently. And think along with me if you've, you may recognize some of them or they may be, may be new to you. But they're all about clashes of values, and you can gauge where your own opinions and values come down on each of these issues and why. All of these cases, I think, maybe not surprisingly, deal with parents and children. I look at the cloning uh, issue, for example. I think, how can we figure out cloning if we can't even figure out what the right way to raise kids is? And so last week, I went down and I spent some time with a group of families in Aylmer, which is a little town south of here, southern Ontario. And I just hung around with them for a few hours. And I uh, had supper and chatted and so on. This is an immigrant community. Um, and I found that they were really very different, I guess, from what I was expecting. But I'll tell you a bit, little bit about what I saw. I, I think they were, they were all great. I really enjoyed them all. Nice people. Um, intelligent, smart, thoughtful, and all of that. There were three families, three sets of parents, and uh, nine or ten kids. And they met all the kids. The kids were great, um, nice kids, smart, um, friendly, sociable, very lively, very polite, well-mannered. Uh, they seemed like great kids. Um, they were neat. 
clean, tidy. And there was something other, it's an other, another interesting thing about this time I spent with them, um, even though it was a large gathering and lots of action, hours and hours, not once did any of those parents raise a voice to any of those kids. And none of the kids raised a voice to any of the other kids. There was no yelling, no, you know, that kind of friction. And to me, externally, I thought, boy, you know, this looks like a pretty happy, healthy, well-adjusted bunch of people. Uh, the parents told me a little bit about their lives. They are all immigrants. They happen to come from Mexico. They came here for the same reason that most immigrants come here, for a better life, better educational opportunities for their children, um, more chance for a decent living, nicer place to live. They lived in a very modest bungalow in the middle of Aylmer. And they seemed like some of the nicest people I had ever met. There was just one problem, and that is that according to the law of Ontario, every single one of these parents is a child abuser. The reason is this. They all belong to a fundamentalist Christian sect called the Church of God. And they believe, they're, they're fundamentalists. They read the Bible, they believe in the Bible, and the, they believe literally in the adage that says, spare the rod and spoil the child. They believe that physical discipline of their children is essential to proper upbringing. And there's more. They also believe that from time to time, they should, when every, everything else fails, if spanking doesn't work, they should use a strap to hit their children. And they told me about this. They didn't apologize. They said, this is a part of our religious belief. Uh, when reasoning with the kid fails and other forms of dis discipline fail, we strike them with a strap on their behind over their clothes. It's meant to hurt, and it does, I understand. Last July 4th, the children a Children's Aid Services and the police raided the house of another set of parents uh, who weren't there that evening, but they're related to this bunch, and removed the seven children in the household and took them into foster care. The reason was they believed that one of the children had a mark on his bum which had been inflicted by a parent using an object. And this was enough for them to declare that the children were in so endangered that all of them should go into foster care. They were there for three weeks, they were interviewed by the police, they were eventually returned to the home, but now the whole case is in the courts because the Child Protection Service there uh, is asking for the right to supervise the family and the children and the parents, the whole thing, because the family has not refused their right to physically discipline their children. Now, I learned something very interesting when I was down there, and that is that there's another Bible, and this Bible is the one that the Child Protection Services use. It's the Bible of Ontario. It's called, uh, it's called the Risk Assessment Model. And on page nine, it says that any use of physical force that causes superficial injury which can include a red mark that goes away in a couple of hours, constitutes abuse. And on page 10, it says that if this abuse is inflicted by a primary caregiver, i.e. parent in this case, then the abuse is severe. And the child protection worker has every right to remove those children from the environment as quickly as possible. And that's what happened. Is our way of child rearing superior to theirs? Well, I guess, you know, lots of people say yes. I don't believe in striking children. I think it's bad. Um, but I had to wonder, because I looked at these kids, 
and I looked at these parents. And by many measures, these parents are what we would call very admirable and very competent parents. They spend a lot of time with their children. They're very involved with them. Um, they read to them more than four minutes a day, which is the Canadian average. They protect their children from secondhand smoke and alcohol and pornographic images, from too much materialism. These kids have stuff, but they don't have a lot of stuff. They don't let them watch TV. They play outside instead. None of these kids are fat because there's no junk food. Who are better parents? Parents who strike them sometimes or the parents who are never there? I don't know. But I'm not sure that the child protection manual has it completely right. Um, the issue of corporal punishment with children is very, very emotional. We've ascribed terrible effects to the outcomes of it. I didn't see them. I don't know. But maybe we have an issue of morality here that's not quite as simple as it seems. And maybe the state has more power than it should. Maybe our notions of tolerance are, in this case, too narrow. As I looked at these people, I thought, well, you know, this is, they're a very traditional society. Um, they dress conservatively. They have, uh, you know, they're buttoned up to here, and they have, uh, they wear their sleeves down to here. Beautifully dressed, by the way, very neat and clean. Cleanliness is next to godliness. They obviously believe that as well. They live in traditional families. The mother's, mother stays home and raises the children. Um, and they have lots of children. They have more than we do, generally. They have, you know, four, five, six, seven is not uncommon. That seems to us today to be very bizarre, as does all this whole Bible thing, because we're in general not a religious society. We're secular humanists. And we think that people who are like that are really weird, and we trust them in many ways less than we trust other cultures that seem, you know, that perhaps maybe are more foreign to us. And I looked at these people and I thought, you know, these people really have the same values that my great-great-grandparents did in many, many respects, the religiosity, the children, the discipline, all that. And yet, in this society, they're considered deviant. Where's the line between difference, diversity, and deviance? It's not always so clear. I'll tell you another story. This is about a baby named Gavin. Baby Gavin was born last fall to parents who uh, were thrilled. He was perfect. But they had to wait a few months to discover whether he had the special gift that they had most hoped for. And they found that he did. Baby Gavin was born profoundly deaf, just like his parents. His parents engineered his deafness. His parents, who are a lesbian couple that's um, by the by, used a sperm donor who's also deaf in the hopes of producing a deaf child. That would give them a 50-50 chance. It paid off. This is their second deaf child. I heard about these parents, and I thought, what? Who are these, these wackos? Um, then I found out something that really amazed me. And that is that among um, deaf society, which is and it's not small, I guess it's about one in a thousand people who are born deaf or have deafness. Uh, there's a large movement called deaf culture. And the deaf culture people believe that deafness not only is not a disability, but is an equally good way of life to the hearing culture. They resist assimilation. They don't want their children to enter the hearing culture. They've redefined disability into a cultural and linguistic minority. 
They think that efforts to assimilate deaf children by, you know, cochlear implants, which you can do now that will give a child partial hearing, are evil. And they think that those of us who think otherwise are prejudiced, extremely prejudiced, as the, the, the head of the um, deaf organization in Canada said in the paper when he was discussing this issue. He thinks that we are extremely prejudiced. They say that these children have the right to be born to silence. Well, I thought about this, and in the end, I didn't buy it, I guess. Um, but it's hard to say you don't in some way because you want to sympathize. You want to be for deaf rights. And of course, where does this come from? It all comes from a very good impulse, which is the empowerment of disabled people and redefinition of disability into something else. As I thought about it, I thought, well, of course I don't think deaf people are inferior to hearing people. But I do think that hearing culture is superior to a world in which you are deprived of one of your senses. And it sounds very rude to say so, and they will say that you are prejudiced. And yet, I thought, what right do they have to take away an opportunity from a kid who will never be allowed to choose for himself? Hard to say that because we tolerate diversity, we tolerate difference. It's hard to say my moral views are better than yours, and I'm prepared to stand up and argue that. And I guess we don't, because the, the deaf culture is flourishing, and in fact, um, lots of folks are deliberately choosing to have deaf children, and we think that's, I guess, okay. Here's another story, and it's again about the state versus a family and their disagreement about human rights. This is a story about a woman named Sandra Crockett who lives in New Brunswick. And she has a son named Adam, who's 26 now. When Adam was a baby, he had a medical event that was unfortunate. It left him partially blind, and it left him developmentally disabled, so that he never, um, his intelligence never developed beyond about the level of a four-year-old. He has some language, um, but he's, you know, he's basically has the mentality of a four-year-old. And in addition to that, when he was young, he was very hyper-aggressive um, and very anxious, and he acted out a lot. And uh, he was given large, huge doses of Ritalin, which would help from time to time, but still he would become violent. Um, his mother's a wonderful mother. She's taken large chunks of her life off away from work to stay home with him and raise him. And he has brothers and sisters as well because it's a pretty full-time job for her. She's also been a single mother for many years. She's remarried now. But as Adam got to um, the age of adolescence, she realized that his sexuality was going to be a challenge. And she began to wonder what would happen and what she should or ought to do about it, if anything. Well, he did reach puberty, and he did begin to act out sexually. Um, he began to get aroused. His sisters would bring their friends over to the house, and he would hug them and rub up against them. And one day, he rubbed up against a smaller child. And his mother realized that no matter what she did, she could probably not prevent him totally from acting out in this unacceptable way. And that one day, he would be out on the street somewhere or somewhere, he would do something um, that would lead to his being locked up. And he would probably inevitably be incarcerated someplace where he could not um, behave inappropriately in public. And so when he was 21, after much consultation with her doctor and other doctors, she decided to have him sterilized in order to control, to moderate his behavior. And she found a doctor who 
uh, performed a bilateral orchidectomy. He removed his testicles. And after the surgery, Adam's behavior did change. He became much less aggressive. He still has some sexual urges, but he, he doesn't sexually act out. And he was able to stop taking the heavy doses of Ritalin. He's still very dependent on his mother. And he, he, you know, he asks her when he can go pee, or he tells her when he can go pee. He says, Mom, I have to go pee. And right now, of course, he's a large 26-year-old bearded, hulky guy. She has to cut his beard for him because he can't do it himself. After she had this procedure done, the BC, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, it's not the BC Child Protection Service, but it is the body of the province, it's where she had the surgery done, the body that looks after child welfare in general, sued her. It sued her for violating the human rights of her son. It sued her on his behalf. And since then, it's five years ago, it has taken her to court four times in order to win a case and win various rights to decide for Adam instead of her, take away her rights to decide. It says that not only has she violated his human rights to not have the surgery, which of course he could not consent to, um, but she has violated his right to have a normal sex life and to experience parenthood. Now, when I started reporting this story, I was surprised by some of the allegations in the suit, but I soon found out um, something very interesting that I didn't know at all, and that is that uh, disability advocate groups and welfare age, social welfare agencies that act on behalf of the mentally disabled are all absolutely determined that with proper social supports, nearly everyone who is mentally disabled can not only be integrated into the community, but can have a responsible sex life and can be a parent. Needless to say, this is a conclusion that the parents of many of these adult children don't share, and I talk to a lot of them. I talk to the mother of a 31-year-old woman named Michelle, who has been unable to get her daughter's tubes tied, and is terrified that her daughter will one day, her daughter's a nice, trusting woman who can't speak more than one word at a time, is terrified that her daughter will get pregnant. But it turns out that uh, involuntary sterilization in Canada is virtually illegal under any circumstances. Um, this dates from a Supreme Court decision of 1986, and you can understand the genesis of it because back there in the bad old days, the 30s and the 40s and even the 50s, we, the state, sterilized many people who were institutionalized, and it was a human, right, human rights crime. What the Supreme Court did, however, was swing the pendulum back so far the other way that now we have the strictest anti-sterilization law in the world. It says therapeutic sterilization is not allowed under any circumstances because it could not possibly be beneficial to anyone. And so Sandra actually broke the law. What you can do actually is you can appeal up to the, uh, the chief child protection agency in each province and you can get an exemption, but in fact, people never do. Because the consensus among these people is that the mentally disabled should be encouraged by interventions to lead as normal a life as possible, normal sex life, normal parental life, and all of that. Sandra is absolutely eloquent on this. She has been fighting them in court for four years. She has no money. Um, she can't get any lawyer to take her case, even if they were working on legal aid because they're not going to touch this one. Um, so she's used all her own resources. She worked as a legal secretary once, so she kind of knows enough to carry on. And she said to me, how long am I going to have to fight these people? She said, the only reason I can do it is because there are so many other parents out there in the same boat who are worried to death that their kids are going to go out there and get locked up or get pregnant. A lot of them do. So where's the human right here? 
Who has abused Adam's human rights? Is it Sandra or is it the state which wanted to, in effect, leave him in a condition that would mean that he could not any longer do the things that he most values in life, which is ramble around the neighborhood and have coffee with his neighbors and walk the dog and be with his mom? I don't know. Maybe our tolerance has turned into intolerance there. Um, these things are hard to think through, but they seem almost impossible to think through sometimes. But they deal with issues of cultural relativism, of tolerance, of diversity, of morality. Morality is such an old-fashioned word. You think morality, oh God, those Bible thumpers. I don't want to have anything to do with morality. But we have to. Because the state is extremely powerful. The state can take children away from their parents. The state can put parents in jail. And because I write about these things, obviously I've been writing a lot about these issues on a bigger stage now, on a global stage, since the clash of values and of cultures right now has come right home. And it's, I think we have the luxury in Canada of, um, uh, of not having them be a life and death issue, but in some places they are. And if I can have just two more minutes, <laughs> one more minute. Okay, because I'm out of time. No. No. I won't do this because I'm out of time. But, um, I think we have to think hard about cultural relativism and also about moral absolutism because sometimes there are cases in which absolutism, absolutism, absolutism is correct and tolerance will get us into a lot of trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Did I go over time? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs>